<laughs> okay, uh, uh, today we'll talk about uh, Osaka, 1970, the great uh, uh, world uh, exhibition that took place in Japan, the first one in Japan in 1970 in Osaka. And let's see uh, what we can learn from this uh, spectacular event. This was the, you know, the visual uh, trademark uh, of Expo 70. Some very important architects uh, produced work for this, um, uh, you know, uh, architectural bonanza, if, if I'm to call it uh, rather, uh, you know, uh, impolitely. The Japan World Ex Exposition Osaka 1970 or Expo 70 was a world's fair held in Suita, Suita Osaka Prefecture. By the way, you know, Tadao Ando lives in Osaka. Japan between March 15th and September 13th, 1970. Its theme was, I quote, progress and harmony for mankind. Wow. Progress indeed in Ukraine, 2022-2023. And harmony as well. In Japanese, Expo 70 is often referred to as Osaka Banpaku. It was the first World's Fair held in Japan, Japan and in Asia. The expo was designed by Japanese architect Kenzo Tange. Well, we talked about him yesterday because he died on the 22nd of March, assisted by other 12 other Japanese architects and some formidable architects. As bridging the site along the north-south axis was the symbol zone. Planned on three levels, it was primarily a social space with a unifying space uh, frame roof. The expo attracted international attention for the extent to which unusual artworks and designs by Japanese avant-garde artists were incorporated into the overall plan and individual national and corporate pavilions. The most famous of these artworks is was artist Taro Okamoto's iconic Tower of the Sun, which you are going to see, which still remains on the site today, one of the few that were not uh, demolished. Osaka was chosen as the site for the 1970 World Exposition by the Bureau, Interna Bureau International des Expositions in 1965. 330 hectares in the Senri Hills outside Osaka had been earmarked for the site and the theme committee under the chairmanship of Seiji Kaya was formed. Kenzo Tange and Uzo Nishiyama were appointed to produce the master plan for the expo. The main theme would be progress and harmony for mankind. Tange invited 12 other architects to elucidate designs for elements within the master plan. These architects included Arata Isozaki, Pritzker Prize for the Festival Plaza, mechanical, electrical, and electronic installation, and Kionori Kikutake for the landmark tower. There was also uh, uh, Kisho Kurokawa, and there were others. Uh, we are talking here about uh, very important um, uh, Japanese, uh, Japanese architects. The Canadian, Canadian pavilion, I, I just so, show now uh, at the beginning a few uh, national pavilions. This one actually received the, the, the first prize, uh, this uh, pavilion. I'm, I'm not very sure how, uh, why, I, I didn't understand. I never understood very well this, uh, this work by uh, Arthur Erickson. But uh, let's read a little bit about it. The Canadian pavilion designed by architect Arthur Erickson feature two national film board of Canada productions. The land, the look at Canada from coast to coast, filmed for the most part from a low flying aircraft, as well as the animated short, the short uh, story, perhaps the city, or short film directed by Kai Pindal. Montreal artist and architect Melvin Charney had submitted a radically different design for the Can Canadian pavilion fashioned from construction cranes and scaffolding, which was rejected. Sometimes the good works are rejected. This is how life is. Anyway, this was built like this, and uh, I read that it received uh, the prize for the best pavilion, Can Canada, Canada's uh, pavilion. Uh, 
yeah, 50, 53 years ago, 1970, Osaka. Germany, the German pavilion, the, the West German, because at that time there were two Germanies, the West German pavilion designed by Fritz Bornemann featured the world's first spherical concert hall based on artistic concepts by Karl Hinz Stockhausen, by Stockhausen. I never knew his first name, now I know. The pavilion theme, although I, I can't pronounce it very well, the pavilion theme was Gardens of Music in keeping with which Bornemann planted the exhibition halls beneath a broad lawn with a connected auditorium sprouting above ground. Inside, the audience was surrounded by 50 loudspeaker groups in seven rings at different latitudes around the interior walls of the sphere. Sound was sent around the space in three dimensions using either a spherical controller designed by Fritz Winkel of the electronic music studio at the Technical University of Berlin, <clears throat> or a 10 channel rotation wheel constructed to Stockhausen's design. Uh, this was, but you know, nice talk, but the building is not very impressive. I mean, you know, it's, it's a geodesic dome, it's a Buckminster Fuller, uh, but anyway, I guess there were some other interesting things happening around it and perhaps inside it, but otherwise the, the dome itself is, uh, is rather simplistic. Uh, you know, these exhibitions, they are uh, uh, pretexts for, uh, for uh, promoting, uh, you know, uh, forward-looking uh, companies, uh, corporations, very often this happens. The USSR pavilion was the tallest in the fairgrounds, a sweeping red, white, and white designed by Soviet architect Mikhail Posokin. And here it is. Of course, the Soviets have to dominate the land and the sky. I'm beginning to be tired of the ideological expression is. You know, they, they never have enough. They have the largest country in the world and, 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 and they still want to eat up other lands. And uh, as we can see in this picture, even the sky. What an arrogance, really. Anyway, 1970, Soviet Union. Here is in front of it is the pavilion by the Netherlands, by Nether, uh, by uh, you know Holland, by the, the Netherlands. Uh, Bakema was one of the of the two architects who built it. We are going to see uh, it a, a little better um, later. The U.S. pavilion was an air-supported dome, a joint design by architects David Brody and structural engineer David Geiger. The net, but I have no pictures. The Netherlands Pavilion was the work of Carol Weber, Weber and Jakob Bakema. Jakob Bakema, uh, and this is this is it. Uh, it doesn't look too impressive now, 53 years later, but uh, it's not too bad, I, I guess. The most spectacular are the works of the Japanese, and we are going to see them in detail later. The Japanese were really remarkable in the forward-looking, uh, you know, aesthetics. The Hong Kong pavilion, topped by sails that were raised and lowered twice daily, was designed by Alan Fitch, Shebo, and Partners. Didn't understand very well. I, I, I need, I need to, I need to dwell more on this subject. Uh, but I have some pictures here. Too bad they are as they are. I don't understand very well what's going on here. But one thing is for sure, these world exhibitions are, uh, you know, uh, uh, occasions for uh, nations uh, to, you know, prove themselves. So the tone is very optimistic. In fact, I'm even tempted, the devil in me uh, suggests to me to, uh, you know, to promote perhaps the idea of, uh, of, um, of a pessimistic world uh, world uh, exhibition, you know, a pessimistic um, national pavilion. What about that? No, it's impossible, of course. 
the Italian pavilion is uh, is nice actually. It's it's you know uh, dramatic with diagonals, uh, making one think a little bit of uh, a certain architecture, concrete and glass and. But it is it is Italian design after all. Paul Rudolph perhaps would have liked it. He did some things not very dissimilar. The Philippine pavilion was designed by renowned Filipino architect Leandro Loxin and was very well received and was judged as one of the 10 most popular pavilions at the exhibition with its dramatic roof sweeping up from the ground using fine Filipino hardwoods and other native materials. This is a rendering. Well, we are going to see the building. I, you know, in my rush to prepare this material, I, I, I didn't always find the, the best pictures. The resolution is um, not quite good, but but this one in black and white is acceptable. But you know, you you have to let him, your imagination complete the the understanding uh, of the building. But these world exhibitions uh, are, are not occasions for worrying. They are occasions for hope. That's, that's the raison d'etre. And that's why it disappoints me to read that Osaka is planning to build some ca casinos, apparently for the first time in Japan, if I understood correctly, not far away from the World's Fair in 2025. That would be the end of my respect for Japan. No, I'm joking, but do we really need more casinos? Fujitsu Pavilion, Expo 70, housing the world's first IMAX projector. What did I say before? You know, it's an occasion for big companies to promote themselves, and Fujitsu knew it, but they built an interesting pavilion. Uh, look at it inflated as it is. No, apparently this Osaka World Exhibition in 1970 was um, something else, as someone wrote about it. And this is a view, but I think they, they had another, I, I think this, this pavilion was, was demolished later or it was not demolished. This might be actually 1990. I, I, I am confused because I, I, I read an information that this was a picture actually from 1990, but the building was built in 1970, this building for Fujitsu. In color, it looks even better, but uh, maybe later we'll have another look at this building. Arata Isozaki. Uh, the picture was identified as some kind of a robot, some kind of a building, robot-like, or some kind of a robot building-like. I don't know. It's, it's something uh, that is both a robot and a building, I guess. Interesting. But this exhibition was very famous for this, that it, it, it created a, a second nature a second nature, an artificial one, a technological one, a futuristic one. And there was a lot of optimism about this because at that time, Japan was, uh, uh, you know, uh, astonishing the world, if not itself as well, through its amazing uh, achievements in, in technology, uh, that they were able to build all these things. Isozaki died a few months ago. Kionori Kikutake, I admire very much Kionori Kikutake, uh, metabolist, uh, Japanese architect. And uh, we are going to see, I mean, his tower is, uh, was done uh, remarkably well. By the way of, uh, by the way of, I don't know what, uh, on the occasion of searching for materials about the Osaka Expo, I discovered that actually Pepsi Cola, and I regret I don't have a picture here, built a building that was uh, very similar to what um, Elizabeth Diller and Ricardo Scofidio did uh, years later, maybe 
30 years later or so in Switzerland, the blurred building. Because uh, Pepsi Cola uh, commissioned some artists and some architects to build a building that would disappear into, so into some kind of a fog. And that's exactly what Dylan Escofidio did about 30 years later. So I guess nothing new under the sky. Or certain people do find uh, occasions to inspire themselves from others. This was also, uh, this was done by Kisho Kurokawa. <clears throat> And uh, we are going to see a few more pictures with it. I forgot how, how it was called, but the tower belongs to Kionori Kikutake. Uh, these people truly believed in technology, but they believed in some kind of a biotechnology because it was technology, very advanced, but there was also uh, uh, the proximity of uh, metabolism and uh, biological processes. So. The technological techne was uh, was uh, continuously fueled by by life actually, and this doesn't happen uh, all the time unfortunately, but it did happen then. Remark remarkably well. Kisho Kurokawa, who visited uh, Romania and visited uh, um, the, the University of Architecture and Urban, is here in Bucharest. He built uh, two buildings, I think, uh, for the Osaka Expo. This is one of them. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it is, it is uh, still provocative. Too bad that it was demolished. I, I just don't understand how you could demolish something like this, but it was demolished. If the, if the saying, the sky is the limit, was ever true, maybe at that time it was, you know, because these people truly believe they can change the world. And it kind of shows. Now, I, I could almost say that they were wrong, but that belief is something uh, I wish we had, we continue to have. Kisho Kurokawa, another metabolist um, uh, Japanese architect. Takara Beauty, Beauty Yon, Beauty Yon, from Pavilion and Beauty, I guess, um, a composite word. Kisho Kurokawa again. These Japanese, they can build anything. Sorry about those pictures. Protection. Um, well, there is a serialism here and a structuralism, but but there is also the bio, the three magical letters B I O. So it's it's uh, mechanicist, it's structuralist, it's uh, serialist, but it's also biologist or somehow it's metabolist. So we. Life is still present somehow within the system. And it is a system, very much so. In 1970, Osaka World's Fair was something else. The, I, these are not my words. I found them on the web. And the, now you are going to see pictures to prove it. In 1970, Osaka World's Fair was something else. Here it is. This, is the, this was the symbol of the of the World's Fair, this giant uh, sculpture representing the sun. Uh, and we know in, in Japan, the sun is a woman, Amaterasu, and, and she is very, very important in the pantheon of, uh, of um, uh, Japanese uh, uh, mythology. Now here, I don't know what's going on, but they do look a little bit, uh, you know, uh, uh, entertaining and uh, and uh, conducive to dreaming that uh, the future can only be good. The tower by Kisho Kurok by uh, Kionori Kikutake. 
Now, maybe this was the, if I understood the, correctly, part of the pavilion by the United States. These uh, things that uh, seem to, you know, escape uh, escape gravity. Essentially, these world world fairs are, are 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 you know shows. That that's what they are. They 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 are meant to astonish. Too bad the the astonishment doesn't last for too long because most uh, uh, these things are destroyed when the exhibition. And I'm going to show at the end of this uh, uh, presentation images of what happened with the land on which this exhibition took place. In other words, what happened, what is now? And you are going to see what is now. And it's not worse than what we look at here, but it's very, very different. But I still think this um, world exhibition of 1970 um, was, uh, you know, uh, an expression of, of, of an optimistic humanity. And I don't know if we, we, if we still have such optimism these days. Probably not. There is technology, but there is also play, playfulness. Uh, it's a ludic technology. Now, I don't know what, what's here. I don't know if in those bottles there is champagne. I don't know what that lady is doing on that uh, you know, sofa. It's all about the future. You know, it's, um, anyway. Osaka, 1970. I think, uh, uh, you know, reflecting on, uh, or, 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 uh, um, you know, trying to do some work for Osaka 2025 would benefit from reflecting on what happened in Osaka in 1970. It's good to know one's past, I think. I don't know how uh, structured this is or pavilion. This is surprisingly, this is the pavilion of uh, Japan and uh, it's less spectacular than the buildings uh, uh, or maybe it is spectacular through the simple fact that it's not spectacular. It's like, uh, anyway, um, I'm, I'm talking in, in maybe cryptical terms or maybe not so cryptical. Anyway, the Japan, as we saw, the, the, there, there were companies from Japan that had very exotic uh, pavilions, that, but the pavilion of the country, which is here, it's rather uh, not subdued, but not very provocative. Anyway, Osaka. Let's not forget this was 1970. At the end of the 60s, there was the great uh, youth movement, no? Make love, not war the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Woodstock, the students fighting against war, uh, fighting against the obsession with money. So there was idealism in the world. And, and, and maybe this um, World Expo somehow um, connected with that, um, um, you know, uh, spirit that existed at the time. And I envy that, that spirit. I don't think we have something similar these days. Above, meaning in this picture, so the above refers to this picture, to this building, Japan Gas Association Pavilion. Laughter is a gift bestowed only upon human beings, and the main aim of this pavilion is the recovery of laughter. Now, what does laughter have to do with the gas, with the gas association? <laughs> Well, I guess it does because you know if you have gas, you know you have uh, you have money, and if you have money, you are smiling because uh, what else could make you smile? But money, no money, oil, petroleum, gas, yes. 
Uh, the building is not bad. I don't know who did it. I don't know in what way it was supposed to provoke laughter. I guess it's kind of like a face now that I look at it, you know, with two eyes and make a big mouth. But uh, otherwise, the, the building is rather abstract. For, further investigation is needed. Other pictures from Osaka 1970. And this is the the it was the symbol of the of the of the of, of the world exhibition in Osaka and it's not destroyed. Now I, I end this imperfect uh, presentation with uh, images of what happened to the exhibition after it ended and what it is today on that land. And what it is today on that land is not bad. So let's read. The site of Expo 70 is now Expo Commemoration Park. So it is a park now. Almost all pavilions have been demolished, but a few memorials remain, including part of the roof or festival plaza designed by Tange. In other places, I read that actually it was designed by um, Aratai Sozaki, but they worked as a team. So. The most famous of the still intact pieces is the Tower of the Sun, which is this one. This is the Tower of the Sun. Uh, the former International Art Museum pavilion designed by Ki Kiyoshi Kawasaki was used as the building for the National Museum of Art in Osaka. And then the museum moved to downtown Osaka in 2004. Additionally, there is a time capsule. This is very interesting that is to be left for 5,000 years and opened in the year 6,970. Wow, a time capsule. The capsule was donated by the Mainichi, Main, Main, Mainichi uh, Newspapers Company and the Matsushita Electric, Electric Industrial Company. The concept creating time capsules at World's, Fair, World's Fairs started with the two Westing, 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 Westinghouse, Westinghouse time capsules, which are to be opened in 6,939. <laughs> Very ambitious uh, time frames. Uh, this was that uh, roofing that uh, says the Festival Plaza and the roof uh, apparently designed by Tange, or he worked together with Arata Isozaki and it was, uh, you know, the largest uh, structure on, on, uh, on, for this uh, exhibition. Osaka, 1970. And now I end with the, a few pictures of the Expo Commemoration Park, which replaced the tumultuousness of the, of the exhibit. The Expo Commemoration Park or Expo 70 Commemorative Park is a park in, in Suita, Japan. It is north of Osaka, about 15 kilometers from Umeda. I don't know what Umeda is. The park is the former site of Expo 70, a World's Fair held between March 15th and September 13th, 1970. It is about 264 hectares of lawn and forest and has education and recreation facilities. The National Museum of Ethnology, the Osaka Expo 70 Stadium and part of the Expo Land are in this park. The National Museum of Art used to be here but was moved to um, uh, the city. Uh, the park has the Tower of the Sun, which we saw a symbolic landmark of the Expo 70, which has been preserved and repaired a number of times. Some of the materials used and built or built in the Expo 70 remain. The Garden of the Sun, this is in the present. <laughs> Not bad. Not bad at all, but very different from the Expo, no? But, but we have to take our heads off our, our heads for the Japanese. I mean, they were able to, you know, uh, create that event very technological, uh, very uplifting with its hope in technology. And look now, they show an equal ardor and this 
and 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 and, and devotion to nature and they manicure this park perfectly and beautifully really it's a special it's a special country with a special special people the japanese i mean it shows clearly that these people when they do something they do it seriously doesn't matter what it is landscape design or techno pavilions this garden this is almost better than versailles I think even um, Andre Le Notre would have loved it. And they are not, uh, they are not uh, you know, afraid to let the, the leaves of the, of the trees fall on the ground. Because the, in, in Asia, in the Orient, uh, they have a deep understanding of nature, deeper than uh, us here in Europe or uh, the West in general. The Japanese garden and Japanese it is. I mean, it is incredible. This is the land on which the expo took place in 1970. I think even God would have said, you know, we banished, uh, I banished uh, Adam and Eve from, from paradise, from the garden of Eden, but, but I see the garden of Eden here. And what else is here, if not the Garden of Eden? It is beautiful, and you wonder. But, but it, seems, it seems that we can do both. Now we can have an expo, a world expo, and we can also have this. Well, not simultaneously. Bravo to them. And this is the site plan of uh, Osaka Expo 1970. And this is the last picture of this uh, um, you know, tentative uh, presentation about, about, uh, about it. And now we, we are going to someone very different uh, to um, uh, Hassan Fatih, uh, because it is uh, this day is. Uh, uh, importance, so to speak, uh, for him because he was born on, on March uh, 23rd. And let's wish him happy birthday. Today is March 23rd. This is another imperfect presentation. I, have to, I had to remake this presentation because I lost uh, the previous one that I, I prepared and, and I apologize. Uh, he deserves better, but it is still an homage to him, imperfect as it is. Hassan Fatih, the great Egyptian architect, born in 1900 on the 23rd of March, and uh, died in 1989. <clears throat> Hassan Fatih, as you can see, March 23rd, 1900, and November 30th, 1989, was a noted Egyptian architect who pioneered appropriate technology for building in Egypt especially by working to re-establish the use of adobe and traditional mud construction, as opposed to Western building designs, material configurations, and layouts. Fatih was recognized with the Aga Khan Chairman's Award for Architecture in 1980. In 2017, Google celebrated Fatih with a Google Doodle for pioneering new methods in architecture, respecting tradition, Egyptian heritage and tradition, and valuing, valuing, valuing all walks of life. But he was an aristocrat. Hassan Fatih was a cosmopolitan, trilingual professor, engineer, architect, amateur musician, dramatist, and inventor. He designed nearly 160 separate projects from modest country retreats to fully planned communities with police, fire and medical services, markets, schools, theaters, and places for worship and recreation. These communities included many functional buildings such as laundry facilities, ovens, and wells. This is not a very poetical you know, uh, description of who he was, but I took it from Wikipedia, of course. He utilized ancient design methods and materials, as well as knowledge of the rural Egyptian economic situation with a wide knowledge of ancient architectural and town design techniques. 
He trained local inhabitants to make their own materials and build their own buildings. I like this very much, but it's not easy to do something like this in, in many pa parts of the world. This was the man, Hassan Fatih, born in Alexandria in Egypt. He wrote a book, uh, you know, uh, Building for the Poor. How do you build for the poor? Usually architects build for the rich. But what if we change that? What if, what if we use our talent and our expertise and our training uh, and our work and our dreams to those who are less privileged? It might not be bad at all to do so. But uh, architects are, as Philip Johnson said, um, high-end prostitutes, very often, unfortunately. Happy birthday, Hassan Fatih. Earth and Utopia. I like this, Earth and Utopia. Why should Utopia be against Earth? Why can't Utopia be uh, part of the Earth and uh, accommodate itself, the human work to, to, to the Earth? Drawings. Some drawings. I love this, his drawings. The tree on, on the left side uh, is, uh, you know, probably um, during springtime or so it seems, but the, the light seems to come from the moon. He was a dreamer. Uh, look at those trees, how they are projected on the horizontal plane of the... I like also this, this kind of rendering very much you know, which contradicts the scientific, objectivist, linear perspective. Now, you can present very well a building, uh, not only a building, uh, in, in, in many ways, not just that uh, obsession with uh, objectivity, you know. This one, I think, is more uh, inducive to, to imagination and, uh, and allows you to to see the unseen as well. Not everything is offered to you. This is an unusual, I'm not even sure it's by him. I included it, but I'm doubtful that it was by him. I don't think it is by him, but this one is. Now, look here, you know, I mean, who would place birds and, you know, myth mythological, uh, you know, uh, animals, on an architectural uh, rendering, because it is an architectural rendering. And I wonder why, although this kind of rendering is coming back now, uh, there are young people all over the world who begin to use their imagination uh, uh, in, in creative ways. And, and, and uh, uh, so this is good, you know, that that, that, that renderings are not done just uh, in order to satisfy an uh, um, excessive uh, thirst for uh, controlling everything, including vision. Now, this, this was probably not done by him. I, it is done in his spirit, but, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't believe uh, Hassan Fatih depicted himself like this in the, I included it in this, but I didn't look carefully. It is not by him, but it, it is, it is uh, inspired this uh, rendering by, by his way of rendering. New Gurma, Gurna, Gurna, this is his most important work probably. 1945-1948, uh, let's read a little bit about him, about it. He gained uh, international reputation uh, because of this uh, construction of New Gurna located on Luxor's West Bank, built to resettle the village of Gurna, which fell within the archeological areas of the Valley of the Kings and the Valley, Valley of the Queens. Fatih's plan devised groundbreaking approaches to economic, social, and aesthetic issues that typically impact the construction of low cost, cost housing. With regard to, economic, to the economic issues, Fatih noted that structural steel was not an apt choice for a poor country, and that even materials such as cement, timber, and glass 
did not make good economic sense. To address this issue, Fatih instead devised a plan that included the use of appropriate technology, notably mud brick construction. Noting that the traditional village, although afflicted with issues of overcrowding and poor sanitation, was also an expression of a living society in all its complexity, Fatih strived to design New Gurna in a manner that addressed the social concerns, including attempting to consult directly with every family in Gurna and advocating for the involvement of social ethno ethnographers in the planning process. Despite this, inhabitants of the former village were not enthusiastic about relocating, which effectively cut them off from their existing livelihood of trading in archaeological finds. Uh, apparently, I mean, he himself said it was a failed uh, experiment, but I think the architecture is, is very good. And, uh, you know, so the critics uh, commented that, that this is not truly a, a domestic architecture, that domed structures belong to funeral uh, functions. And, uh, but, you know, the critics are critics. Uh, the creator felt uh, um, doing things in a certain way. And there are even better pictures than the ones I, in a, in a, in a hurry I try to find, because as I said, I had a PowerPoint presentation, I just couldn't find it. Um, this is very different from Osaka, 1970, of course, but I don't think it's, uh, it's less significant. And it's certainly an architecture that uh, said hello to sustainability long before we became uh, concerned with it. Sometimes, sometimes I have a feeling that uh, his relationship with tradition was a little bit uh, literal. Uh, and we are, I, I'm going to, to show a few examples where I think, I think uh, he, could, he could have done a little bit better. But this village that he built in the 40s is, um, is quite remarkable. Too bad that some of my pictures are not, uh, are not good enough. I mean, to bring uh, even monumentality, a humane monumentality, not a crushing monumentality, to a little village in, in, in Egypt shows great skill, you know, because these are not expensive buildings. But, but he, this picture that we look at is, has a high level of authenticity, that you feel that, you know, this building belongs to these people and these people belong to this building. Hassan Fatih, who was not a poor man, as I said, he was an aristocrat. He studied, uh, you know, and worked for years outside of Egypt. And, uh, you know, he, um, he was, um, you know, a man of means, he was well-to-do, but, but he had, uh, his heart was closer to those who uh, usually don't have uh, the means to hire uh, an architect. Let's read a little bit about it. The village of, um, no, this is, uh, now I begin the second section of this um, rather tentative presentation. Uh, and, and, and now I'll show just one picture for each uh, work that I show. I discovered the website, which um, advertised itself as, um, as showing 15 most important works by Hassan Fatih. <laughs> So we begin with the first one. We already saw it, the village of New Gurna, 
which was partially built between 45 and 48, 1945 and 1948, is possibly the most well known of all the, of Fatih's projects because of the international popularity of uh, his book, Architecture for the Poor, published nearly 20 years after the experience and concentrating primarily on the ultimately tragic history of this single village. While the architect's explanations offered in the book are extremely compelling and ultimately persuasive, New Gurna is still more significant for the questions it raises rather than the problems it tried to solve. And these questions still await a thorough objective analysis. Um, I, I don't know very well what happened, uh, you know, that why is it a tragic story? Why is it that the, the experiment failed? But when I look at this picture, I, I would say it didn't fail. This is very good architecture. Uh, a house in Fayum in Egypt, number two on the list of 15 uh, important works by Fatih. Uh, this one, I don't know if I should read all of this. Um, cited on a long thin peninsula of land projecting to Lake Ah, too many, too, too, many, too much data. The design is document represents an ambitious first interpretation of the client's requirements resulting in a solution that is quite large in both plan and vertical section. Raised on a man-made podium to protect it from flooding, the house plan revolves around the interplay between an arcade square exterior courtyard and the high formal vertical dome to which it is connected by a deep window and ah, too much, too many words. This is the building. This is this this is this house that he built. Now in a new Baris village, this is an interesting work, um, and unfortunately, uh, I don't. No other project dominates this mature phase of the architect's work as much as the village of New Baris in a way that is comparable to the notoriety of New Gurna twenty years before. So this was built twenty years after New Gurna. This remote and forbidding wilderness outpost designed by him, which is almost in the geographical center of Egypt, was planned to initially house 200 families, of which more than half were intended to be farmers and the remainder to be service personnel. His previous experience with such a project and particularly his ability to build it inexpensively made Fatih the logical choice as the architect for new bodies. I only have one picture and I regret I don't have more, but it looks impressive. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, uh, a citadel, a citadel of uh, dignified uh, domesticity. I like it very much. The earth, the building, the sky, nothing else. Uh, residents in Cairo, uh, I don't know who these people were, Katarina and Gary Andreoli, foreigners who lived in Cairo in the 1980s. So he was in his, uh, you know, he was uh, 80 years old, uh, Fatih, when he designed it. Uh, the outskirts of Cairo is not. I don't see the city. It's a huge city. I don't see it here anyway. Um, yeah. An apartment in Cairo, Shahira Mehrez. I had in the previous picture many pictures with this apartment, which I like very much, but here I have only one. The first of Fatih's residential projects upon his return to Egypt, because as I said, he lived for many years outside of Egypt, is small in scale, but has a combined effect that far exceeds the physical size of the area concerned in order to personalize her apartment, the sixth floor of a building designed by another architect, Shakira Merez asked Fatih to try to work within the extending, existing framework to create a more varied and individual series of spaces for her. Uh, unfortunately, I have only, only this image and it's not the most telling one, but uh, anyway, um, an apartment building in Cairo, probably. Ceramics fa factory, a second community oriented project that followed New Gurna. At this time, was a Jesuit based crafts center 
located at Garagos, which was intended to improve the standard of living of the people in the village there. The plan for a ceramics factory, while deceptively low tech in appearance, represents an extremely logical and efficient production diagram for the manufacture of pottery. And it could have been a chapel that you know you manufacture things in. The nice ambience. Uh, what is this? Another house is an unusual fine example of Hassan Fatih's consistent care for residential space use for hospitality. The outside area enclosed by arcades is primarily given over to this function and balances well with the more private character of the interior. These are the drawings. Um, uh, work in the United States. Uh, Dar al-Islam in New Mexico, the, Mexico, the last community project undertaken by him, a non-profit ed educational organization established in um, that place, New Mexico. Um, yeah, this is the building. I'm not so sure about this uh, importing uh, Egyptian um, sensibility uh, to uh, to the United States in such an explicit way. But what would have been the alternative? Uh, again, uh, outside of Egypt, a private residence for the al Sabat family entirely constructed in brick and completed during 1981. Uh, so eight years before he died. Some of the, the arches appear to have failed and in 1988, Another architect undertook the restoration and completion of the residence according to Fatih's designs. Uh, yeah, I regret uh, I don't have here more pictures of his early years. Uh, what is this? A studio um, in Cairo represents an important project among all Fatih's projects because it is the first documented application of mud brick construction and is still standing. The first phase, which was built in 1942, was simply a studio and sleeping space for the artist and his wife, incorporating a large vaulted loggia as an open exterior sitting, uh, open exterior seating area, from which to appreciate the seemingly endless green palm grove surrounding the property. The construction of the house coincided with the climate of concern among Egypt's intellectual community at the time about the de detrimental effects of industrialization on the traditional cultures of the world and the need for a search for Egyptian origins in the face of the threat. Hassan Fatih. Another residence, Saudi Arabia, the house was built with a stone block recovered from the demolition of the traditional tower houses in the old city, which the client unsuccessfully, unsuccessfully tried to save. Rather than using the familiar dome over the Majlis here, I don't know what that is, uh, the architect felt that an octagonal God, it's becoming technical. The text would be more regionally appropriate. And the use of this particular element carries over into a larger house designed in Tabuk soon afterwards. I don't like this house, to be honest with you. Where Saudi, Saudi Arabia. No, it's, it's, I don't know. I don't like it. Uh, rest house in Egypt. We are approaching the end. We have three more houses. The last one will be his own intended as a rest house to be used on official trips, on official trips to the isolated area around Lake Nasser in Nubia. The residence is actually made up of three separate buildings sequentially, se sequentially organized according to the status of each. Uh, large, large residence indeed. Um, yeah. Another house, this house and several others that followed it 
in the same area were built in local limestone because of a governmental ban on the use of mud brick. And he was a master of mud brick following the construction of the high dam as well as unsatisfactory guard. Too much, too much, uh, too much text. This is the building. But it is, a, it is a building that uh, one would uh, recognize as a Hassan Fatih building. A house in Giza, Egypt, the Kasaroni residence, a pathway of the basil, as it has been called by its owner, is very near the, and is one of the most elegant of Fatih's residential works yet to be built. Construction was once again overseen by the client rather than the architect, more specifically by Mahmoud Fakmi, who saw to its timely completion. I don't like it. And now the last one, which is his own, uh, in the house designed for himself in Egypt, the use of typologies and tradition, traditional forms is combined with influences from other cultures, transforming them in his style. The design of the house has noble sobriety, and the human size and all the pieces have been designed according to a symphony of forms and ideas, but also moods and materials. Fathi wanted the house to be a successful prototype of a low cost structure, all beautiful, but also a model for tourist units. I don't know about this. I didn't know this text. I don't like it. I don't, I don't like this kind of, you know, making a house for yourself to be a model for touristic units or tourist units. But someone wrote this. Uh, this is the house. And uh, I think the house is better than the words trying to describe it. And this is, I think, the last image of this imperfect uh, presentation about Hassan Fatih on his birthday. Thank you.